Hello and welcome to this video. My name's Murray Beckham. Let's take a look at where the Objects and Animations screen fits into the process of making a presentation. One of the ways we can get a feel for how the Objects and animation screen works is by creating a simple animation project. By doing that we'll be introduced to the power of this screen and we're going to see many of the tools used in a practical way. You're watching an example of what we're about to create here. Let me say first up that we can in fact make a slideshow and never ever visit the objects and animation screen at all. But it's well worth a visit because it's the place that opens up so many creative opportunities. It's one of the reasons we enjoy PTE AV Studio so much. The objects and animation screen allows us to add a wide variety of animation and effects to any image or video that we've selected from either the slide list here or the timeline. Now we can jump from the slide list to the timeline with a touch of the F6 key and we can go back using the same key. As we look at the images in the timeline here, the objects and animation screen is going to show us just the part of this timeline from here when the image first starts to appear onto the screen to here when it's finally removed from the screen by the next image or video. Working with the default settings here that's a seven second part of our timeline. Now that's made up with a two second transition onto the screen, three seconds while the image is fully on the screen and two seconds off. Now we may ask, is this seven seconds enough time to create the animation we intend to create? Well, perhaps not. So I'm going to use the F6 key to go back to the slide list and I'm going to extend the center image of these three to a slide duration of 10 seconds. Now I can do that by simply clicking into the little box at the bottom right of the thumbnail and I'm going to set that at 8 seconds because remember we've got to take into account that we have 8 seconds here which is 2 seconds for the image to appear on screen. It's going to be static or in our case slightly animated for 6 seconds and then it's going to be removed from the screen in 2 seconds by this image. So when we look into the timeline or the objects and animation screen our time scale is going to reflect 10 seconds. Now I've just hit the F6 key once again to bring us back into the timeline and if you count those one second markers you can be reassured that in fact we have 10 seconds from the start of the pelican shot from the final moment it's about to leave the screen. So with the pelican image selected, let's click into the objects and animation button down at the bottom left of the screen. So with the pelican image opened up into the objects and animation screen, we can see that it shows us exactly what we saw in the timeline. It's the full slide duration from when the image first begins to appear on screen here, to when that image finally leaves the screen, here. We can preview our work at any time using the objects and animation screen and the buttons over on the left hand side. But the grey bars that show our selected transition times, two seconds in our case, they're just indicators here. We can't physically see the transition to the next image in the view above like we can with the slide list and the timeline. Now keyframes are what controls all of the animation in this screen and the first keyframe here is always created automatically for us 
whenever we add an image, video or object. So for basic animation we'll always require two keyframes. One to determine the settings at the start of the animation and one to determine them at the end of the animation. We can create as many keyframes as we want or need and it's why this screen offers so many creative possibilities. So if we select our first keyframe we can decide where the image needs to be at the start of our animation. Now I'm going to reduce the zoom of the image to start my animation and I may give it just a little rotation as well. Now there's a couple of ways we can adjust the zoom. One of the ways is to just pick up the edge of the bounding box around the image and I can just drag it in to the size that I want. Remember you've always got Control Z to undo the last thing you've done which sometimes comes in handy here. Another way to be able to change the size of the image or the zoom is to go up to the zoom controls and you'll notice there's a chain link here. That links the height and the width of the image together. So I can go to the little wire here and you'll see a double headed arrow appear or the X and if I just drag to the left or the right I can affect the zoom. So what I'd like to do is drag this down a little bit and I want to start somewhere around there. Just before I commit though there's one final thing which is very useful here. If I change my mind and I want to reset that of course I've got Control Z but if I just double click the X we're straight back where we started. So let me apply that once again quickly. So I want my image to be quite small and I'm going to go down to rotate C and for some reason I've got a little bit there that I shouldn't have had. Double click, there we're back to zero. All I want to do is to click and drag. Here's one more way when you only want to make a small movement. Place your cursor in the box and use the up and down arrows to just rotate the image the amount you need. And that looks pretty good to me. Now we need to consider where this first keyframe is positioned along the timeline. This is where these grey bar transition indicators can be used as a guide. Do we want our image to be zooming as it begins its transition onto the screen? If so, our keyframe needs to be at the start of the transition here. If we wanted our image to appear fully on screen before it actually starts to zoom, then our keyframe needs to be dragged along the timeline to somewhere after the transition indicator, maybe somewhere around 3 seconds. Keyframes can be clicked and dragged into any position you want, as you've just seen. But as well as click and drag, we can place them precisely on the timeline using keyframe time over on the right hand side. So if it was crucial that this keyframe was set at 3 seconds, and it probably isn't here but it could be in other animation projects, then we can go over to the keyframe time and just overtype the value. I'll put 4 in here, 4 seconds, which is 4000. And as you can see, it's very easy to click and drag or just adjust keyframe time. So if I change my mind even before I leave the keyframe time box, I can go back and I can put 3 seconds into the time. Now I'd like my image to be gently zooming and rotating forward as it transitions onto the screen. So my first keyframe needs to be on the left where it was first created. Now we need our second keyframe and we can create that anywhere along the timeline. Just place the cursor anywhere you feel appropriate, right click and we can add a keyframe. Our next creative choice is do we want our image to still be zooming right up to the time it leaves the screen? Well in that case we'd have to pick up the keyframe and move it to the extreme right hand end and there you can see the 10 seconds is being reflected here. Or do we want the image to come to a stop 
prior to it leaving the screen, as my demo did. In that case, we need to slide the second keyframe to a point prior to the right hand transition bar. I suspect we need it to be somewhere around 6 seconds. That gives us 2 seconds with the image static before it starts to leave the screen. So why don't we use keyframe time here. With the keyframe selected, I'll just overtype the 10 with 6000. There's our keyframe in the correct place. Now of course we need to set up the animation at the end point. Now that's going to be pretty easy. Let's first go to the zoom controls up at the top right. Tick the little box to bring them into play here. And you can see the 31% that it currently has, which we put in the first keyframe. So if I double click the X, I can bring it back full screen. But in actual fact, I don't want it quite filling the screen. So I'm just going to bring it back a little bit. But I do want to tick the rotate box as well and reset the C rotation. So that's the sort of thing I'm looking to achieve. We can put the cursor back at the first keyframe at any time and we can click the play button and we can observe what we've just created. Now if our animation will end before the image is fading out we may want to consider adding a speed modifier such as slow down. To do that we need to select the first keyframe, this one here, and we need to go up to our zoom and our rotate controls up at the top right. So let's go and do that first with the zoom. Over to the right here add a modifier animation speed and I want my image to slow down and come to a gentle stop as it reaches the second keyframe. But as I've got a rotation in my animation, I'd like to apply exactly the same to that too. These speed modifiers make our animation smooth and gentle on the eye. I do have a dedicated video on the subject of these modifiers and I think that's worth a view. Well, so far so good. I can go back and select the keyframe at the start and it will show us the image in the position we set. I can go to the second keyframe and click and it will show the image at the second position we set. What I'd like to do here though is to add a degree of embellishment. And we can have a little recap of how we animate images. What I'm going to do is to reselect this image and use it as a background. Let me show you how we can do that. I'm going to start by going down to the bottom right corner. I don't want any selections at all here, so I'm just going to click into this little box to remove them. Now we need to go way up to the top left to a little icon at the top left which will add an image, but it's rather a long journey from there to there. We can do it a little quicker by right clicking, choosing add, image, and I can select my second image, which is this one. And as you can see, it sits way over the top of the one we've just animated, and in fact covers it up, but we'll fix that next. Now given that we've selected the same image to use twice, seeing both identical names here could be just a little bit confusing. So this one I want to make a background. If we go directly above my cursor, we can select the Properties tab. In the Properties, we get the opportunity to change the name of just that value in that bottom right box. So for example, if I wanted to, I could actually type the word background in here, or anything else that was appropriate. But of course if we're going to use this image as a background it needs to sit beneath image 002. Now we do have shortcut keys for this but possibly the easiest way is just to select the background, right click, choose order, back one, now it's sitting behind our image. 
I'd like to go back and select the first keyframe so I can see my first image as small as possible because what I want to do with this background is add a degree of blur and maybe even a little light animation there too. Let's take a look by going up to the top right and clicking into the animation tab. What I'd like to do is to go down to my blur options here. If I just put my cursor over the letter R as you can see I get the double headed arrow and if I just scroll gently to the right I can soften my background as much or as little as I require. I'd like the image to be slightly larger too so I'm just going to drag out the corner toggles and of course I could add some animation to this image independently of the one we're viewing in the center. To do that I'd need to right click and add a keyframe. It's added the keyframe at the end so there's the first point of my background. Ignore the image in the center for a moment. So what do I want to happen between that keyframe and that? Well maybe I'll have a little bit more animation just a little bit and also if I go back to my first keyframe maybe I'll also have a little bit of a reduction in the opacity so if I click and drag to the left I'm just giving my image now a nice background subdued but it makes the pelicans stand out nicely but I think we can improve on them too so going back down into the bottom right box, let's select image 2 and give that image a drop shadow and a thin line around the outer edge. We can do that by going back up to that properties window. Select the image and its first keyframe. Go to our border and tick it. It's got quite a thick border there. I think I'll drop that down. The width is in pixels here, so I'm going to drop it down to about 10 pixels. We can click the panel here and use any color we wish. Usually I choose a slightly off-white, just so it's not quite so distinct. But here, for demo purposes, I'll leave it white. But if I just click the panel, you can see we've got infinite choice of colors here. And down the bottom here, if I tick the shadow, the shadow will appear automatically and you do have the opportunity via customize to move away from the default values, but they work remarkably well. So maybe it would be a good idea here if I place my cursor at the start, press play and we just have a look at what we've created. A lovely gentle stop couple of seconds to view the image and then it will begin to fade out. Now as you can see by the spinning round of the screen I brought you into the timeline. Looking into the file list above you'll notice that I placed in there a piece of music. I'm going to drag that file down into the timeline because there's a new feature in PTE AV Studio 10 that I'd like to show you within the objects and animations screen. So let's go back in via the button below. Now the new option is the ability we now have to see the WAV file within the objects and animations screen. Let me go to one of my images just for a moment and select it so we can see the keyframes. To bring the WAV file into play, we need the Tools button down at the bottom right. When I click it, we can select the waveform from here. Once I have selected it, and you can see there's a shortcut key, if you look above my cursor, you can see I can even make it bigger or smaller. So I can show the waveform, then I could go back in, and if I wanted to increase that to say 200%, I can do that. Now this is an important new feature because much of the time when we're animating images we also want to synchronize the animation to the music or sound we're playing. So if I just temporarily move the keyframe here, for example if it was important that this keyframe lined up with that peak of the music you can see how easy I can achieve that. Now we can see the music track wave file. 
Now just before I forget I'm going to return my keyframe to its rightful place and I'll do that by just over typing the keyframe time to the 6 second point. One of the other important things we have in the objects and animation screen is the ability to see the keyframes of any images we have selected on the right hand side. So for example if I hold my control key and select my background layer as well as my image on top I can see all of the keyframes and with some animations that can be very important too. Now in fact there's quite a lot more to the objects and animation screen than we've seen here. We're just covering the basics. For example if you look up at the top left of the screen we have the icon to introduce a video. We also have an icon to create masks which open up enormous creative possibilities to us. We also have frames as well. Now they can help us control more complex animation. We can even add interactive buttons into our presentation. Now I think that in practically every presentation we're likely to make we're going to need text at some stage either as an opening title or as an end credit. But we also have the ability here to introduce rectangles and shapes and they are just another creative avenue to explore. And every one of the options that I've just mentioned can be animated in a number of ways. In addition, over on the right hand side in the animation tab, we also have the ability to explore 3D animation as well. Now there's one final aspect of the objects and animation screen that I must touch on just before we leave. It's the parent and child relationship. Imagine a parent walking down a road holding the hand of a child. When they get to the T-junction at the end of the street and the parent turns left, the child goes left too. We can apply that sort of setting to our images, video and objects in the objects and animation screen. Here you can see I've got an image which is just called number three. It's the third one in the set of three we've been using. But I can right click with that selected and add an image here. And when I do it in this way, you can see it's added in a slightly different way. It's linked. You can see it's slightly offset. All I want to do to bring this video to a close is just to put my cursor back at the start and I'll press play and you can see that only the parent is animated, the child is just attached to the parent and will do whatever the parent does. And this is very creative too. If I move over to the right hand side and just select the image which is the child of the parent, you can see we've only got one keyframe so there's no animation there. The animation is taken from the parent, picture 3. Now I think you're going to have quite a bit of fun working with the objects and animation screen. But with videos like this one there's always things we can't include. There's just too much within the objects and animation screen for us to deal with everything in one video. Now although that gives us a little more to learn, the fact that we have so many creative opportunities within the objects and animation screen is a pretty good thing. If you'd like to download this video to keep, you'll find a link below to my website. If you're watching on YouTube, then give the video a thumbs up, if you think it's warranted of course. Maybe I could also encourage you to subscribe to my channel, and if you click the notification bell, you'll be informed when I next post any content. Thanks for watching.